from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Good morning. Welcome to today's program, Create Your Future, The Peter Tracker Way, featuring Bruce Rosenstein. I am Gulnar Nagashabaeva, Business Reference Specialist at the Science, Technology, and Business Division of the Library of Congress. It is my great pleasure to introduce Bruce Rosenstein, Managing Editor of Leader to Leader, a publication of the Francis Hessel Hesselbein Leadership Institute formerly the Leader to Leader Institute, and earlier the Peter uh, Drucker Foundation for Nonprofit Management, and Jossie Bass. He's the author of Create Your Future, The Peter Drucker Way, published in November 2013, and Living in More Than One World, How Peter Drucker's Wisdom Can Inspire and Transform Your Life, published in 2009. He worked for USA Today newspaper for 21 years, until late 2008, as a librarian and during the Final 12 years also as a writer about business and management books for the money section. Since 1996, he has taught the Special Libraries Information Centers course at the Catholic University of, University of America. In 2012, he was one of two uh, recipients of the 2012 Rose L. Vormelker Award of the Special Libraries Association for dedication to mentoring, outstanding instruction <coughs> in graduate school settings, and for his own professional achievements. He has studied Drucker's work for more than 25 years. He wrote extensively about Drucker for more than a decade before the publication of his first book. He conducted one of the last interviews with Drucker seven months before his, before his death in 2005. In 2001, he wrote a series of columns about Drucker for the SLA publication Information Outlook. Besides USA Today and Information Outlook, he has written for several publications, including Leader to Leader, Leadership Excellence, GAMA, International Journal, American Executive, and others. Peter Drucker, often called the father of modern management, penned numerous influential works on organization and management. Rosenstein, in his second book based on the late Drucker's wisdom, demonstrates once again that Drucker's teachings go beyond the discipline of management. Today, Bruce Rosenstein will tell us how Drucker's time-tested principles can be applied to shaping not only the future of your organization, but your own personal and professional future. You will have an opportunity to purchase a copy of the book after the program, uh, and can you can have it signed by the author. Without further ado, I present to you Bruce Rosenstein. Well, thank you, Gunnar, for that really nice introduction, and it's it's just great to be here um, at LC. Um, uh, thank you to uh, to Ellen Terrell, to uh, Jan Hurd, uh, Tom Mann, who I don't think is able to be here um, um, today, but uh, Tom started the ball rolling on this um, quite some time ago, and so I'm really grateful to him and, and anybody else at at LC uh, who I'm not aware of who who was involved in doing this. So thanks to you all for coming, both people who work here for LC and people who came um, from the outside. And it's a, just a real thrill. Uh, you know, you heard about my library background, even though I'm not a day-to-day -day librarian anymore. I'm still very much part of the world, so it's a real thrill and a real honor to speak here at LC. Now, I've spoken here before, um, both solo and as part of panels and that sort of thing, but it was always library related. This is the first time that it's related on um, my, uh, as I said, even though library is part of my life now, my world, uh, part of, you know, my, my reinvention um, as an author within, within a, a separate but related world. So this is, uh, as Goldenar said, this is my second book on Drucker. The first was published by um, a really uh, nice independent publisher in San Francisco called Barrett Kohler in 2009. The new book, uh, which came out in November, Create Your Future the Peter Drucker Way, is uh, uh, McGraw-Hill. And um, the first book was published in f uh, four countries around the world, and we're hoping that happens not only just those four countries, but more for the, um, for the second book. 
Um, how many people here, just so I can kind of get the lay of the land, how many people uh, during Drucker's long life saw him speak either in person or on TV or... <coughs> Okay, so a, f a few of you did. Okay, uh, he definitely had a contact. He he had um, within the library world. He spoke at a Special Library Association annual conference in 2002 in Los Angeles. He was one of the keynote speakers. Uh, Monday morning, um, in those days they had two keynote speakers. Monday morning was Peter, and then on uh, Tuesday morning was Doris Kearns Goodwin, um, and. The night before Peter spoke, now he was 92 years old at that point. The night before he spoke, um, I did an interview with him for USA Today, a sit-down interview with him, four hours. Um, and I was just completely drained by the end of this interview. And, you know, we were staying in the same hotel, and we did the interview in the hotel um, at a restaurant and in his room. And I was just completely um, drained from spending four hours with, with Peter Drucker. Uh, and then thinking about, you know, how am I going to write this um, story? Fortunately, I didn't have to write it the next day. You know, it, 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 I wrote it a couple days later, and it went through a variety of changes and came out a little bit after that. But And Drucker, at 92 years old, 9.30 in the morning, gave a keynote to, you know, what, three, four, five thousand 5,000 um, librarians. And that story, by the way, that article is on my website. There's a, there's a lot of, you know, free material on my website, including... Um, Pretty much all the articles I wrote about Peter for um, for USA Today. So as Gilmar said, he was the considered the father of modern management, but way, way, way beyond that. I mean, way beyond just management. Even though that's true, he was the father of modern management, and he wrote what 39, 40 books. But they weren't all management um, related books. And part the the theme of the first book living in more than one world is that you have a number of different things going on in your life for a variety of different reasons it's something that he taught that he preached and he lived that life and his books cover a wide uh, range and i was very pleased that i've been included on the the finding aid on on your website for peter's material along with his own books and other books um by him so um Drucker wrote about a, a really wide variety of, of, of subjects, and I don't want to reinvent the wheel. So I don't want to, uh, it's not up to me to really talk yet again about Drucker on management, although I do that somewhat in both um, of the books. But in the first book, what I did was I put a framework around his work on the individual as opposed to the organization. Again, it was something I was waiting for him to do, and he never did, so I thought, I'm going to do it. And then the second book, it's on his work on the future. This voluminous amount of work on the future, but he never did one book, um, you know, strictly speaking, um, on the future. So I said, you know, that's what I'm going to do. There, there actually is a, a chapter in the first book called Creating Your Future, but it's, it's, I approached it in a much different way um, in terms of uh, how, I, how I did the, um, the second book. I'll also say in terms of these ties with the library world that my whole interest in this began 28 years ago at Catholic University when I was a student, uh, when I was a library school student. And in my management class, it was a summer course, it was taught by Dwayne Webster, who some of you might know, who uh, Association of Research Libraries uh, for many years was the director, at that point was the uh, associate director. But, but Dwayne was teaching as an adjunct, as, as uh, teaching the management class, and he assigned as the, the, the textbook the classic Drucker book, 874 uh, pages, or 834 pages, Management, Tasks, Responsibilities, Practices. Now, as a summer course, we didn't have to read the whole book, but we, we had to read a fair amount of it, and I was just entranced. I knew who Drucker was, I'd heard about him, but I'd never read him before. And it spoke to me on a really deep level. And I should say there is nothing in that book about libraries, nothing whatsoever. Um, but I had discovered that even then he had um, spoken to various library groups and I found some articles about it. Uh, I, found some, I found a speech uh, 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 transcript. Um, and this just really got me going throughout my library career and it got me going on the whole idea of of learning more about management, learning more about Drucker, and that became my specialty. And as Gunnar said, after I was at USA Today for a certain amount of years, uh, I already had a lot of library, I mean, sorry, a lot of writing experience. I had no library experience when I started library school or at USA Today, zero, none. Um, but I had a lot of writing experience, 
And then I just move that into the realm of writing about management books, business books, and especially Drucker books. And first it was just writing about him, about books about him, and then I had the opportunity to do interviews with him by fax, which is kind of funny when you think about it now. Um, and um, part of that was his hearing, you know, which wasn't too great. Uh, I mean, you know, keep in mind, he was at that stage, I mean, he was quite advanced in years that he was still putting out books, he was still speaking. Um, so, you know, if any of us are fortunate enough to be around at 92 and asked to be the keynote speaker at an SLA or, or similar conference, I think we'd be doing, uh, we'd be doing pretty well. So, um, th there was that tie there in terms of that everything came together in 2002. He was scheduled to be the speaker at um, SLA in Los Angeles. I was already writing about him and I already had some contact with him. And I said to my editor, can, if, if uh, I'm going to be out there, and he, has a, he had a new book coming out at that point too. Uh, a, it was a collection, but it still it was a new book. And I said, I'd like to do a, a feature story on him rather than just kind of book reviews. And, and he said, well, if you can get him talking about the corporate scandals, then you can do, we can, and if it's good enough, we'll do a feature story. And again, so this was another thing where the gods came together for me because the corporate scandals were going on then. It was Enron and, and that sort of thing. Um, and so, you know, we asked him for an interview. And as I said, we were staying at the same hotel. And he said, we'll, we'll meet for drinks at 6.30 and see, see what happens. He had his, I'm not going to try to imitate his accent, but he had this deep, he was, he was from Austria and his deep um, accent um, and spoke in a very low voice. And he said, we'll meet for drinks. Uh, at the bar, and we did, and USA Today sent their their top uh, photographer from Los Angeles with me. So I think he sort of, instant, Drucker saw instantly that things were like a little bit different, that he wasn't just kind of meeting me, that we had the photographer there. So um, we we just went up to his hotel room, and then the photographer did his thing and left, and then uh, we went to um, the restaurant, we went to a Japanese restaurant. There's a big, I'll tell you a little bit more later, big connection between Drucker um, and Japan, and there was a Japanese restaurant in the hotel. So again, this led to four hours, and you know, he, again, this is on the website, but he did, he, he told me about the uh, corporate scandals, and what I'll basically say is he said he's just not, he wasn't surprised um, that these things go through cycles. He lived a number, so many years that he saw these things happening in waves. Um, one thing I remember that he said was that it's always the brilliant ones who get caught, which I thought was quite, quite interesting. So, um, um, so th that w that really emboldened me to write, to write a book. I had not written a book at that point, and I called him up and said I wanted to come out to California to talk to him. Um, and I wasn't asking for his permission, but I was just saying I want to do this and I'd like to be able to talk to you. And of course, it'd be a whole lot better to do the book if he'd talk to me and not just rely on other sources. And, um, and he did. So I went out there several times to uh, talk to him. One of those talks, um, the one was seven months to the day before he died in 2005, we did a video. It's professionally shot and edited. There's a, there's a trailer for it on my website, but sometimes when I do presentations, I do the full, it's 20 minutes of, of me you know, interviewing Peter, we're both on screen, and the, and the video on my website is just title cards and um, and Peter, uh, and again, that is not about um, um, libraries or, or it is somewhat about information, but it's about things that are applicable to all of us here today who are either uh, librarians or somewhere involved in that world or in the information world or whatever world you're in. My my guess is that you are what Drucker called a knowledge worker. He was the one to come up with that term uh, in the 50s, and so in this whole idea of of the future, it just really fascinated me about um, he had written so much but just didn't do that one book that tied it all together and I felt that really needed to be done. So in the second book um, there are some direct, uh, there's some interview material that I did with Peter that was um, uh, not used in the first book but um, there's, I took things from various um, books that I felt were relevant, of Drucker's books, included those. I also reached out to other um, thought leaders, uh, people, whether they were involved in the Drucker world or not. Some of them were people that I had come to know through um, 
being the managing editor of Leader to Leader. There were people who, who wrote articles for us. Um, so just people I've gotten to know over the past however many years. And I included all that material. And I also have breakout boxes with um, quotes from Drucker's books. And I think that, you know, especially for those of you who are librarians, I think you will enjoy that that part of it. Um, and, and also the fact that there's a, a if I must say so myself, a really good resources section at the back of the book of, of books, websites, journal articles, um, what have you. So, but pulling all this together was not easy. Um, I came upon what I felt were 10 elements. He did, he did not say, you know, these are the 10 elements of the future. He did not say that. But I'm saying that based on his work. And the first part of that is that the future is a mindset. It's how you think about it. It's being forward thinking. It's being future oriented. It's factoring tomorrow into your decisions today. And you see this over and over in, in, in Drucker's work. So that, that's the first part of it. The second part of it is that the future must be created. That you can't just leave it to chance. You can't leave it to fate. You can't say, well, we don't know what's going to happen in the future, so therefore, you know, who cares? And I'm just going to kind of keep my head down. Um, and he basically said that was not good enough. It was not good enough for individuals. It was not good enough for organizations. And I'd like for you to, to, to think as you listen today and then beyond this, and perhaps if you're reading the book, to think about this on several levels, to think about it uh, for you personally, professionally, um, for the whole profession, whatever your profession is in, and if I could be so bold as the Library, li the Library of Congress as an institution. I mean, every institution now has to really, and I'm not saying you're not because I haven't checked into it, I'm sure you are, thinking of the future, but uh, the information world, as we all know, is, is moving so rapidly, changing so rapidly, that um, I would you know, challenge you to think about where all this applies to the future of where you work. Um, and I know that I'm, I'm really on to something about the future because um, another challenge I'll give you is see how long it takes today, maybe on your way home um, tonight um, commuting, to come upon an ad, TV, web, radio, newspaper, magazine, that's future themed. It's not going to take you very long. I'm very attuned to these things now, so I see them all the time. Um, Intel, sponsors of tomorrow, very often financial, um, um, very big, expensive, full-page ads in you know, The Economist or somewhere like that. Financial institutions, I think part of that is the future is scary. Um, there's no doubt about it. It's anxiety-producing. And I think these organizations are saying, um, <clears throat> they're acknowledging that, that it, but, and they're also saying, subtly or not, you know, we can help you with this. So I know that I'm onto something. If, if these big corporations are spending millions and millions of dollars on advertising and marketing about future-oriented themes, I think that I'm onto something with what I'm doing. Because what I'm doing is not about predictions. It's about how do you take this material and, and it's an approach. And, and, and it's, it's all contained as I could make it um, within the book. So just keeping th that it's, um, I, I do treat the, 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 um, um, the theme in the book about people who do make predictions on the future. Drucker, at least in his writing, was a little bit down on this, although some of the things that he did, if you look at them, if you read them on the page, they read like predictions but he didn't call them that. Um, in one book he said he, he, he called what he wrote con conclusions. So is that the same thing? I don't really know. But I do list some of the other futurists. I think that some of the futurists that are out there now are really writing some really interesting material. And you have to just, uh, you, you have to kind of take it in. And a lot of it is not, is based really on what's going on now. Some of it's um, science and technology based some but it's not so i mentioned some of those in the book um, you know here in the washington area we have the world future society um, which i became a member of in the past year or two it's based right here in bethesda and i mentioned them in the book and some of the work they do there's also something in california called the institute for the future um, uh, i mentioned a book by uh, one of their um, executives named bob johansson which was published by barracola the, the, the company that did my first book so i think there's a lot of good work in that area um, but it's, it's somewhat, somewhat separate from what I'm doing, even though I've mentioned it and referenced it um, in the book. So I mentioned some other 
elements, but I don't really want to go into those right now. They're they're um, you know they're in the book. Um, another thing, though, I want to say is that he came up with this idea late fifties, early sixties. It was a great phrase called "the future that has already happened." And I mean, he used this in a number of different contexts for years and years and years. First time I saw it was um, in something that I think it might have been a speech in uh, the late, very late 50s. But it was in a fantastic book that's very future oriented that I would recommend to you from 1964 uh, called Managing for Results. Uh, and then in 1997, when the Harvard Business Review had their 75th anniversary, I mean, think about this. Wouldn't you like to be um, Harvard Business Review has their 75th anniversary. Wouldn't you be like? Wouldn't you like to be the person they come to to say, "Would you please write a special essay for our 75th anniversary issue?" There were four or five people that they asked. Uh, I, I name all of them in the book, and one of them was Peter, and he wrote an essay called "The Future That Has Already Happened." Um, but the idea is, well, well, how do you really discover this if these are things that have, in essence, in essence, their their history? But there are things maybe where the, the ripple effects have not yet been been totally seen. So um, now Drucker didn't really sketch these things out a lot. Well, you, you do X, Y, Z. Um, however, what I came up with was one is through human intelligence. Things like meeting in groups, like orienting um, book groups. Many of us are uh, part of a book group. And then you, you meet about within a group of people in a book group that maybe has a future theme uh, on books that might have that might detail what the future that has already happened. Uh, another is journal clubs. I did not know anything about journal clubs um, until 2010, when uh, Catholic University, the Mullen Library, the main library, invited me to speak there to, to be the speaker for their journal club. And they said, instead of a journal article this time, we're going to do your book. And I, you know, I have to admit I didn't know what it was, but I got fascinated in the, in the idea, and I saw it was a big deal in the world of science and um, and medicine. So I think this is something where we could easily, easily do um, future themed articles or whatever within journal clubs. As a matter of fact, last week, last Thursday, right here in D.C., I was the guest speaker and the moderator for the journal club for an organization called A1, Association of Women's Health uh, and Obstetric Nurses. Uh, and that was really a fascinating experience to to be in on on their group. So those are ways. I mean, another way is something that's obviously very key to what you all do here in this building, and that's what's available online. Um, that most people now, when you think about it, people on the outside world have access to things both obviously at LC, but through their public libraries as well have access to, to online material that would have been unthinkable not all that long ago. So um, a lot of people, I think, do not realize that, uh, let's say in the case of public libraries, that they have this kind of access just through their library cards. I think maybe that public libraries need to do a better selling job um, about that. But there's just there's so much fantastic information out there that before was considered totally proprietary, as you know, or very expensive, and that now people can access. Um, and for those people who are lucky enough to work at an organization such as th that might have a special library or an academic library that have even deeper access to, let's say, scientific journal articles, business articles, you know, all the better. So, but thinking of it and thinking of the implications of what does this mean to me personally, professionally, what does it mean to my um, organization where I work? And what does it mean, maybe, to um, um, profession? By the way, Drucker was, uh, he, he would often advocate, even going beyond that, to, to, uh, to, to short anecdotes to say about that. I interviewed a number of, uh, for both, both books, um, I, I interviewed his students. And one of his students um, told me that, um, she said that, Drucker told them that when they were making decisions, business decisions, one of the things they should factor in, not just, you know, is it good for me, is it good for my organization, is it good for my family, whatever, it was, is it good for mankind? Just like, you know, how many people say that? Um, and also, I relate an anecdote in the book. In uh, 1964, when Managing for Results came out, he was the commencement speaker at the University of Scranton, where Scranton, Pennsylvania, where I grew up. Uh, at that time, I would have been a young boy and oblivious to who 
Peter Drucker was, that maybe like he was one mile from my house giving a commencement address. Um, but I, have, I found a newspaper articles about it that were fascinating, absolutely fascinating about what he told these graduates. And that's one of the things, and by the way, these people now are of retirement age, which is pretty interesting. And, but, but he told them to, that, that they really had to think about mankind, and they had to think about the, the, um, the, the money that had been invested in them by their parents, by their community, and by their society. Um, he was kind of a, he was a, 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 could be a real tough love sort of guy as far as giving advice to people and to corporations. There's, an, there's a, a line from one of his lesser known books that I quote, quote in the book, in, in my chapter about organizations, there's a line saying that, um, I don't have the exact quote right in my head, but he basically said that even, even the seemingly most successful corporation of today is a sham and a failure, and that is exact wordage, if they are not actively building their own new and different tomorrow. I mean, that's, that's pretty interesting. And you see this played out. He wrote that in 1996. And of course, you, you saw what happened in the years after 1996. And a lot of organizations that thought they were really big and powerful, um, you know, had, had met their, their cup, come up. And so he could be very, very um, direct with the people that he was um, consulting with and his writing and what have you. Uh, I should say, though, that I always found him to be very warm. Uh, he, I, he had a great sense of humor. Um, and I treasure those times that I interviewed him. I treasure that video that I did. Um, no one can take away those experiences uh, from me, no matter what happens with my books, no matter what happens with my speaking, with my career. No one can take away the fact that I had that kind of access with this just towering figure. Um, as some of you may know, he. He uh, was given the Presidential Medal of Freedom in 2002. When I, intervie when I interviewed him in the restaurant, it was June of 2002, and he knew that I lived in Washington. And he said, um, I'm going to be there soon, but I'm, I'm sworn to secrecy. I can't tell you why. And of course, that really, you know, uh, why is he coming? Because I also knew that at that point, he really, you know, his health wasn't the greatest, and he wasn't doing a lot of traveling. I figured, this has got to be important. Because I should say he, he lived in California also. He lived not far from uh, Los Angeles, so uh, in, in Claremont. So I figure this is pretty big. And uh, again, this is, again, the God smiling on me sort of thing. In between the time we did the interview, then it was announced that he was getting the um, Presidential uh, Medal of Freedom and was yet another great thing to be able to, uh, to, to put into that USA Today um, article. So again, I found him to be uh, very warm. Um, he answered his own telephone. He, he, he had no clerical people. He was a real one-man band. So uh, you know, he would answer his own um, telephone. When we set up interviews, he did all that on his own. So it was, it was, it was quite interesting. Um, so the other thing then becomes how, how do you get that way? I mean, I think a lot of us would like to just get a, just a little bit of this kind of huge level of achievement that Drucker had. Um, and we're talking about on three parts, on consulting, lots of for-profit consulting with companies like um, Procter & Gamble, uh, various car companies, healthcare organizations, but also lots and lots of pro bono consulting as well. Uh, teaching. Um, he taught at a school named after him, the Drucker School at, at, at Claremont, before that at NYU and uh, a couple of other places. Um, and then the writing. Um, not only the 39 books or 40 books, depending on how you uh, count, millions and millions of sales all over the, um, all over the world, um, but many, many articles. He wrote a column for the Wall Street Journal for 20 years. He wrote a number of articles for the Harvard Business Review. He wrote for Forbes, Fortune. The Atlantic he even wrote for things like Saturday Evening Post, so um, I thought, well, you know, how do you get to that point? Um, I came up with this um, concept, which, in, in the interest of time, I won't go into it now, but it's explained in, in detail in the book, in the third chapter of the book, uh, called "Becoming Your Own Successor." And I thought, well, what, what were the real things that that kept Drucker going and kept him 
so much in the public eye and so popular and and being so achievement oriented um, when a lot of people just would have maybe just retired. Most of his books, by the way, came out, majority of the books came out after what would be retirement age, after 65. I mean, he just sailed way, way beyond that. Um, and I marked the uh, part of the book here because I want to make sure I um, get this right. Um, so what were these things? And I had to really go through the material and see what, what was it, I think, that separated him out. Um, the first is kind of what I alluded to just a moment ago, that you diversify your efforts and outputs. Um, and, you know, again, he wrote these books and articles on a regular basis, what people maybe didn't see in one way, they would see in another. Um, as I mentioned with the consulting, the, the for-profit companies, lots and lots of nonprofits. I would recommend to you a great book uh, that was uh, that came out in 2013 by Rick Wartzman, who's the executive director of the Drucker Institute in California, uh, which is next door to the Drucker School. And it's called Drucker, A Life in Pictures. And what they did is the Drucker Archives, which I'm sure everybody in this room would really appreciate the Drucker Archives, even if you're you know, fortunate enough to go there, or even if you're not, it was tremendous, they've digitized tremendous amounts of um, material on their website, and I would recommend that you go there. But what, what so what they did is they got a really good um, Los Angeles photographer, and I'm blanking on her name right now, but they got her to to photograph lots of things that were in the archives, and then Rick wrote um, text around them. And one of the things was these sheets of paper that showed his pro bono consulting. And it was just, I, I mentioned some of it in my book. Um, it was just a wide variety of people. So he would meet, I think he, one of the reasons he knew about the future was because he was hearing about it from all these different sorts of people. Um, he was hearing about it from the for-profit end. On the non-profit end, he was hearing about it from universities, from museums. Uh, he also did labor unions, by the way. A lot of people think, oh, well, he was just doing business, big business. That's not true. One of the things that you'll see if you get um, a look at Rick's book is uh, you'll see notes, a couple notes back and forth with uh, Cesar Chavez. Think about that. So it was not just like all the Procter and Gambles of the world. It was Cesar Chavez uh, and, and, and museums and universities. Um, uh, as well. So, uh, and again, wouldn't we want to be in this position where people like that wanted to come to us um, for help, whether it was pro bono or paid or not? Um, second point is, I don't think he would really like this terminology, but it's true, developing a, a powerful personal brand. I, I just, you know, this is, this is a, a concept that's been out for quite some time now, but it's true. I think all of us, rightly or wrongly in terms of the term, but it's true. We've got a brand, and hopefully our brand is based around things like um, integrity and quality, and that's certainly what Drucker stood for. And you looked at the name Drucker, and you kind of knew what you were um, getting, and I think we all need that for ourselves. Um, the third point was maintaining a global outlook and worldview. Drucker was born in Austria. Uh, he went to college and grad school in Germany. He worked in London for a while, then came to the United States in 1937. He used to do, um, so he would teach during the year at Claremont, and then he would do, in the summertime, he would do Asian and European lecture tours. So he certainly had this global outlook. And one of the reasons I put it in the book was when I interviewed him on that, that time in a video in 2005, and I said, well, you know, you had the classic book, Effective Executive, in 1967. If you could update it now uh, in terms of things like the changes in telecommunications, you know, what would you put in there? And he said to me that th things like ch changes in telecommunications were certainly important, but what was more important was maintaining a global worldview and outlook. And that, you know, it's a wide world out there. When you think about it now, um, the things that we can do are accessible to people anywhere in the world. We can work for people anywhere in the world. Uh, the world has, has shrunk a lot since, let's say, 1967. So I think that's important for us to keep, keep in mind. Um, the next is remaining relevant. What is it that you can do to remain relevant over a long period of time? And again, here was Drucker at 92 being the keynote speaker for, um, for SLA. I mean, they theoretically could have had anybody, and they asked 
him. So, I mean, I think that's up to you in terms of what you're going to do to remain relevant. Um, certainly within the library and information worlds, remaining relevant becomes harder and harder all the time through technology and other things. It just does. Um, so, again, it's something to think about and talk about a little bit more in the book. Um, and something I think is really important is the, producing this consistently impressive body of work. That you, I think for a lot of us, it's going to be a portfolio of projects that we can point to rather than saying, you know, I had this job, this job, that job. A lot of times job titles are meaningless. What does librarian mean right now? It can mean a million different things. But you can point to things that you've done. Drucker obviously could with his books and articles. Uh, and now, think about it, they're so much more accessible than they were before. Uh, books that were harder to get, that he maybe published years and years ago, are now easy to get. They're digital articles before that, you know, you would basically maybe have to come to the Library of Congress to get. Well, a lot of those things are now available. And it might not be available for free, but they're available. Um, and obviously that's not just him, that's lots of other people. So the, the, this, this body of work, that whether it's on our website, whether it's things that we can point to that we did, but that it's, hopefully that it's impressive and that it's done over a body of time and that it's cumulative. I think that's really important that what you do is, is cumulative. Uh, and then the last point is that uh, creating work that uh, benefits others. And that was really, I think, what a lot of his work was predicated on, is really helping people. Uh, he did a lot of mostly, I would say, informal um, uh, mentoring of people. Sometimes there are people who we had business relationships with, and um, sometimes it was other people. And he really developed these friendships, but also really these mentoring relationships, whether or not he would use that word. Um, has anybody ever read any of the books or know about Bob Buford, B-U-F-O-R-D? Uh, Bob uh, is a really fascinating person. I wrote about him a little bit in the first book and mentioned him in the second book. And uh, Bob was one of those people who had both a business relationship and a friendship mentoring relationship uh, with Peter. And Peter hardly ever, ever wrote forwards to people's books. They were asking him all the time, but he didn't do it. Um, but he wrote the forwards for two of Bob's books. And uh, Bob is somebody who's very successful in cable television and then eventually um, move from that world into the world of nonprofit, um, also into the world of uh, spirituality and religion, which um, I talk about in, in this book as, as well. Um, but uh, Bob um, wrote four you know, fantastic books, and he has a new one coming out called uh, Drucker and Me that I believe is, is really going to go into this issue of the, of the personal relationship, besides what he learned from him in a business sense. So I'd recommend any of his books um, to you. But again, this whole idea of, you know, how do you help people with what you're doing? Um, in, 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 in the first book, if I must say so, so myself, he gave me some great quotes during the interview. And, and in the first book, I asked him about people who were just pretty much money-oriented. And he sa said that the, the people who are money, if you're money oriented, you know, you're probably going to make money. But a lot of those people were miserable. You know, yes, you need to make, make money. There's nothing wrong with doing that. But he said people who are achievement oriented, he said, if you, if you make money at a certain point, well, what's, what's left? He said, but, if, but he said things like if you had um, a company that's working, a hospital that's working, those were his actual words. He said, he said that's something you can point to that you're never you're never finished with. I mean, you can point to those achievements, but you never run out of things to do. You never run out of good, um, you know, good work to do. So I think he was this really, he predicated so much of this idea on, on, uh, on helping others. Um, and, you know, with the consulting relationships, he would, you know, he could really pick and choose. And as he got older and his traveling got harder for him, he really reduced the amount of clients quite a bit. And they would have to, um, you know, they would go out to California and spend time with him. Another thing he would do, by the way, that I thought was like very cool, was that when he would want to know about a subject, a couple of things he did. He did three-year study. He would pick a subject and then just study it for three years. And this is really pretty much before the online era now. It's pretty easy to do that now. Um, for him, it would have involved a little bit more work. But one of the things he, he did, which I thought was like fantastic, was that 
say you're the expert on a particular subject, he would call you up, whether you know he knew you personally or not, and said, um, you know, would you come out to uh, California and spend a day with me and talk with me about this? And you know, hey, I would do that if, if I were called. I'm sure most of us uh, would would do that as well. So we maybe we can't really call the top expert on a particular subject to uh, to come and meet with us, but we have so many ways of of doing these types of things that that made Drucker um, made Drucker so. Um, important, important to the world. I just want to say a few more things and then I want to go into Q&A and then um, hopefully sign some books outside. Uh, the last point was this whole idea of building your future um, beyond the workplace. As I mentioned about, um, you know, with organizations, he had that kind of tough love approach and I go into that much more detail um, in the book. Um, in terms of both organizations and individuals, what he recommended was combining two things, a systematic abandonment, which is if you weren't already doing something now, would you, would you do it? And that was one of his uh, uh, tenets. The other was Kaizen, which is some of you know, or maybe a lot of you know, is this, it's a Japanese term, but my understanding is an American process of slow incremental improvement day by day by day. In, in my book, I called it remove and improve. So you remove the things that no longer work and you improve what's there. And he said that would then lead to genuine um, innovation. Um, and, and the last point in this idea of, of um, something else where I've marked the point in the book because I want to make sure I get it um, correct. Um, th this idea of how do we develop as adults both within the workplace and, and, and outside of it. And one of the... Uh, uh, people who wrote an article uh, for me for Leader to Leader, her name is Jennifer Garvey Berger. She's a leadership consultant in, in uh, New Zealand. Um, so I asked her about this and um, about the, the, this future-oriented part of her work on adult development. Um, and just uh, real quick, I'll read this and, and end on this. In my own work, she said, the adult development ideas help us think about how much how much of the future different people can grasp and how abstract their sense of the possibilities might be. We all know that earlier in our lives we are more present oriented and we think rather that, rather narrowly about the impact of events, often just those things that affect us or those to whom we are particularly close. A rich and nuanced view of the future, as well as the sense that we can work to create or author our own future rather than having more of an audience relationship to the future, comes later in our developmental journey. Uh, I think those are really powerful words. So again, what I try to do is bring in Peter, bring in these thought leaders, bring in my research and this whole idea of how we can um, create the future. So I, I would love to take some questions now. Uh, yes. Okay, thank you for the question, and, and I've been asked to, to kind of restate the question. So the question is, for libraries who are under severe budgetary restraints and who are either maybe even about to be closed or under threat of being closed, um, what can be done? How should, how should those people, especially people who are not maybe business-oriented or who don't read these sorts of books, how should they think about uh, and deal with the future? Um, and it's a wrenching question, and I think it's, it, it, it goes over a number of different libraries. I think we're talking public. Uh, I don't know a whole lot about the academic world, but I'm sure the academic world has their challenges. But certainly the public library world um, is being threatened to some extent. Um, and the special library world, the world that I came from, hugely threatened. I have personal um, 
you know, I, after 21 years at USA Today, I was laid off. There is no library anymore at USA Today. Now, I love USA Today. I still read it. I still have friends there. Um, but it, the media, very many of these media organizations just felt that they no longer needed libraries. So I think you need to approach it in a number of different ways. If there is a way to, if the library is really threatening extinction, um, I think you need to think about, uh, and again, every library is different. It would depend on what type of library it is. But I would think, you know, you really need to think about what the mission, what the purpose. Strucker was very big on the whole idea of purpose. You know, what is it you're trying to do? Are you doing it well, really in an objective sense? Um, are you doing it well? And if that library is worth saving, and it may be worth saving in some part, maybe not all the individuals within that library are going to make it, maybe not all the parts of the collection, if there is one, are going to make it. Um, but I think that uh, certainly one of the things that um, they need to do is to step back, maybe separate from the workday, um, and individually or in groups, maybe it's a good idea to do this combination of systematic abandonment and Kaizen. Maybe there's things that they're doing that they've just been doing for a long period of time and they don't need to do um, anymore and then improve what's there. Certainly working on their relations with whoever the funders are. Uh, and hopefully it's not too late to do that. In some cases, maybe it's just going to be too late to do that. Hopefully all along, you're not only doing your work well, but you're keeping up your re relations with the people who um, matter and you're, you're doing your, your marketing well enough and your, your brand. Um, but I think you raise a good point that the individual is part of this too. And you, that ind those individuals have to decide, let's say that library is going to close in five years. Well, I think they need to decide what's going to happen for them within those interim five years. And um, <coughs> is this something that's worth being part of? for those five years or not. Uh, and in the book, I talk a lot about what kind of ongoing learning can people get, uh, whether it's through community college, through MOOCs, through going back for a degree, whatever it might be. Um, and so uh, I think people need to look in a very clear-eyed way about these things, both as a, as a, you personally, not just, not you, but individuals personally, professionals, um, and, within their libraries. But these are great wrenching questions that are playing out over and over. And then I think it also means what's going on in the overall organization. Uh, not that, you, that you don't see the library as an island, that you see the library as part of the organization, whether or not it's a special library, um, and then uh, considering that within there. So again, you know, whole books, conferences can be part of that. But thank you for your question. Other questions? Yes. Does your book come with the audio version? Uh, yes, thank you. And I did not plant that question, but uh, uh, <laughs> uh, there is. The first book did not have an audio component. This book does. A company called Brilliance Audio, which is owned by Amazon. It's a it's a, an MP3 and a six six CD um, um, spoken word. Uh, so thank you very much for uh, for reminding me um, about that. Um, other questions? Yes, ma'am. I'm wondering, since um, we have a body of work, so to speak, um, focusing on management and Drucker in particular, I'm wondering, was there anything in particular over time that was a surprise to you um, as you got to, to know Drucker and also as you saw how others others, people like your colleagues and the like, might have reacted to his insight to the like. So basically, you know, what surprised you during this journey? Well, thanks for the question. Uh, the, the question is, what surprised me during the journey of interviewing Peter and, and getting to know him and writing about him? Um, um, and I think that one thing is that at the beginning I did not know that um, I had to make that mental shift from reading about him for, for years and years and thinking about him as sort of an untouchable sort of figure to actually having to engage, you know, to call him up about the book, to call him up about arranging the interview. Uh, and I think that one thing was that, you know, once, you know, he liked what I wrote about him. If I was just coming as a total stranger, maybe it'd be a different thing, but he'd already seen the things I wrote about him. So I was kind of in the system, um, as it were. 
but seeing how within that how approachable and personable um, you know he could be and besides the whole idea of you know answering the phones and all that when we did the video and I'd never done a video before and this was at the the Drucker Archives building that I mentioned to you um, but this was in in 2005 when it had a different configuration than it does now and so we're sitting there and we're kind of getting set up for the video and again I'd never done them Peter had done lots and lots of videos over the years many many videos um, so uh, he said to me uh, as they were putting the mics on us and everything he said um, well what should we call what should we call each other and I certainly had not thought of, thought about that um, and I said um, well how about if I call you Dr. Drucker he said no. And I said, uh, well, how about if I call you Professor Drucker? He said, no, I hate that. Um, so I thought, okay. And then there's just like a beat. And he said, well, how about just Peter and Bruce? And I said, it's okay with me if it's okay with you. And, you know, it was just like, what a cool thing for him to say. And that really put me um, at ease. And, you know, within that, when we did that video, he, as I said, his hearing wasn't really all that great. So I had given him questions ahead of time. But during the interview, he was, a, maybe it's because we were sitting close enough to each other, the follow-ups, which he, did, he didn't know anything about, he could hear perfectly. And so he, he, he was thinking about some of these original questions, but there were a number of follow-ups as well. So he was able to handle those perfectly, totally off the cuff, and I think that was something that, again, to me was very, very impressive that he was able to do that. So I think that approachability, that warmth, um, I think Bob's book, Bob Buford's book, will, will bring that out. Um, I try to bring a little bit of that out in the book, but I try not to make it too, too personal. There are some personal things, especially in the second book. Um, and uh, my uh, publicist, Patty Danos, when she read the book, said that she could tell it was written with both my head and my heart which I thought was, was really great. So thank you for your question. Do we have maybe one or two other questions? You know, I can go on all day doing this, but I know that you have to get back to work, and, um, but I can go on all day talking about these things. Um, do we have one or two uh, questions? Uh, remember, I, I teach. I, I will call on people if we're <laughs> not. Uh, um, um, I have another question. Sure. Um, you know, I'm familiar with Kaizen because of Deming. And, right. Um, Some of the reading I've done of Drucker that he had an interest in Japanese culture and Japanese art in particular. Were you able to get a sense of, you know, whether that was a passing thing or, or how that came about? Well, thank you. And and yes, it, it was a big, big part of his life. Um, and I wrote about it in, in both books. It was definitely not a passing thing. It was something that went from um, the 1930s uh, was when he first got interested in Japanese art until, you know, basically the day he died. He built up a big collection, um, and so it, the Drucker School, um, when they had the, the uh, 100th anniversary, what would have been the 100th anniversary of his birth in 2009, uh, and I was out there both for that, and then the, the book ended part of that in 2010. So they, they showed this collection of art. It was fantastic at the Scripps College, which is part of the Drucker, uh, uh, Claremont uh, Schools, at their art gallery. It was called Zen, Zen with an exclamation point. Fantastic thing. Um, I, I, I mentioned in the books that he's, he, for a couple of years he taught Japanese art at Pomona College, which is also part of the Claremont Schools. Um, there's a great book that I reference in my book called The Ecological Vision, and you can, he wrote, uh, there's a whole section in there about Japan, not just Japanese art, but one of the chapters um, is about Japanese art. It's absolutely uh, fascinating. So Drucker was huge in Japan. He would go there like pretty much every year. Uh, my first book came out in, 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 in the Japanese language. Uh, I was really privileged to speak there. Uh, uh, there's this entity called the Drucker Workshop. Uh, I was one of the, the main speakers for their annual uh, meeting in Tokyo in May of 2012, an incredible experience. I stay in touch with a lot of people from um, Japan. So it was really very, very ongoing, and the, the level of interest in Drucker in Japan is so huge. I mentioned in the second book, the biggest selling book, and this is true, in, it's either 2009 or 2010, in Japan, 
biggest selling book is a novel about it's kind of a graphic novel of um, and it's the loose translation is what if a female manager of a high school baseball team read Drucker's management this sold like two <laughs> honest to God it sold like two million copies uh, I met the author um, uh, who's now on the uh, Drucker Institute Board of Advisors. I met him and spoke to him uh, after my uh, talk. And I have a I don't understand it. I have a copy of the book. They gave me a copy of the book. Um, I mean, this was huge. So when you think about that, and apparently it brought up. I mean, it was a story of how you you know this this young woman uh, in managing her high school baseball team used Drucker's principle and turned a team. My understanding was they were sort of a, a high academic but low athletic school. And but she said, well, you know, we should be both the high academics and high and high athletics. So using Drucker, she you know had them win the championship or whatever. Um, so uh, so and then this Drucker's workshop, Drucker workshop. I mean, there's all these CEOs there. I mean, it was quite amazing. I mean, uh, you know, they had to pry me out of there. You know, they had to pry me out of that. I didn't want to leave that building that day. So um, it's really, really huge in Japan. Uh, so thank you for that question. So thank you. Thank you again for having me. Thank you very much. Uh, please stay in touch um, and um, have enjoy the rest of your, your business day. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.